So uh, everyone, welcome to today's webinar. Uh, my name is James Wagenschutz. I'm with First Beat Technologies, and we are super pleased to have Gavin Benjafield, who is the Director of Performance at Los Angeles Football Club, joining us today to discuss uh, monitoring internal load. And uh, Gavin, welcome to the call today. Thank you. Hey, thanks, James, um, for having me on. Um, we're going to have a, a flow today where we're going to do a, a brief introduction of Gavin and a first beat. We're going to talk about the current demands of soccer, how, how Gavin views it, talk about internal load monitoring and sessions, uh, how they do it with Los Angeles Football Club or LEFC, um, talk about return to performance. So kind of the player's journey, if they come back from an injury or uh, joining mid-season or, or things that might uh, impact their return to performance. We'll talk a little bit about kind of their player development pathway and basically what Gavin was saying is they have kind of an internal drill database where they can start to look at uh, player benchmarking. And uh, we do have a Q&A function as part of the webinar. So if you have a question as we go, or if there's something that you've got planned in advance that you'd like to ask, drop it into the Q&A and we will either address it while we're on the slide or we'll bring it up toward the end for final Q&A. Um, the other folks on the webinar today are First Beat Headquarters and Benjamin Jensen, uh, who will help monitor the Q&A and, and let us know if there's things that we're missing along the way. We expect to go about 40 to 45 minutes today, um, and so we really look forward to the call and the conversation that Gavin and I will have. Uh, so thanks for being here. Gavin, um, it seems like you've had quite a journey uh, all over the world. Yeah, absolutely. It has certainly been a journey, and and I think a lot of guys on this call, guys and girls on this call, are going to have something similar of a journey. Um, and yes, yeah, so I'm I'm originally from South Africa. Um, I'm married. I have two boys, um, and they've all been along on this journey with me. I've got some really cool photographs of different jerseys that we're wearing in at different heights, and now I've got a son that's six foot one. He towers me. Uh, the other one's catching up really quickly. And so they, they've been on this international journey as well that, yeah, with the privilege that football has given us of being able to play in, in different uh, different leagues and being around the country. So, yeah, as it says there, I started actually in cricket um, with the Bangladesh national cricket team. That was wild, uh, living in Dhaka for three years. Uh, but what an incredible journey just to see uh, the passion in Asia for sport of cricket. Um, I thought that that was going to be me. I was going to kind of land and go back to South Africa and, and be in cricket, obviously being a, a big cricketing nation. But very quickly, I, I got drawn into the academy um, at I at Cape Town. Um, and then from academy to the first team, and then kind of the launch just happened after that. And then a lot of the years with I at, obviously the, the duel of Cape Town and Amsterdam, uh, of joining a team that is an expansion team. Like I've, I've never worked with this thing called an expansion team. What's an expansion team? It's like, there's literally no history. There's no infrastructure. There's nothing. It's a concept. And that was a huge appeal for me because obviously working in other teams that are well established for 20 years, 50 years, I was over a hundred years established before I, I entered the doors. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and then LAFC 2018, inaugural season like make it what you want and so i think that that's a great um it was a great attraction for me soccer it doesn't really make a difference football you have just some phenomenal players that are not necessarily athletes um and so i'll explain that you you have a guy that fails all the fitness tests but can stand at the crease and smack the ball around the park and has phenomenal batting averages or and you have in football as well, you have some guys that just don't tick the athletic box, but they just have something special and they entertain and they bring something to the party. And so I think that that's the best observational comparison that I can give in terms of having worked in, in two different um, sports at a professional level. And as much as we want to get these guys to be athletes, um, maybe keeping them as players um, is our job. That's fascinating thinking about being an elite player, no matter the sport, they can be an elite player without having perhaps maybe the ideal profile of 
uh, the athletic specimen for that sport. So that's, that's fascinating. Exactly. Thanks for sharing. Just real quickly with First Beat, um, for those that are not familiar with First Beat and are joining us for the first time, we've been around for two plus decades uh, and over a thousand teams all over the world. 25% of Champions League teams use First Beat as part of their internal load monitoring. 40% of the Premier League, really big into hockey and the NHL. And you can see the statistics on the right. And the cool thing about First Beat is we use all of the RR interval or the HRV data to provide real time heart rate metrics. And then the real crux is on the back end, the software and the analytics where we can provide unparalleled physiological analytics for those that want to do a deep dive. So we're really pleased that LEFC is in us with this partnership and uh, use us for internal load. Gavin, one of the things that was really um, fascinating for me and in, in getting to know you and, and the team there is um, you've got kind of an unusual high performance department or team. Can you explain a little bit about your structure? Um, yeah, sure. Um, so, yeah, that's a, a picture of uh, last season. Um, the guy in the middle is holding what's called the supportive shield. Um, a little different in the, the U.S. Um, you play in the entire season, 34 games, and then you win this thing called the supporter shield if you're the number one team across East and West Conference. And then there goes into this playoff series, and it's one-off elimination games, um, seven teams from the East, seven teams from the West, and they kind of thrash it out, and you get what's called the MLS Cup winner afterwards. And personally, this is, the shield means... Uh, it, it means a lot. It's for me. It's that consistency of thirty-four games to be the the number one. That that's the championship, really. Uh, and the MLS Cup is for me almost an extension of the program. But it's it's highly regarded and highly valued here. And if you can do the double, and uh, yeah, with great performance last year, we were able to do the double. We were the Shield winners, and then we were the MLS Cup winners as well. And if anyone followed it, it was obviously this crazy uh, journey through the playoffs playing some of the best teams austin uh, galaxy and then philadelphia union which is always a competitive game and gareth bale's 128 minute equalizer and then went to penalties it was like what a wild night yeah never never gonna forget that but back to this kind of department uh, structure so um all of us on this call was like we we've either had to hire we've either had to hybrid or change i really last season at the beginning of last season i was like i want to go in a slightly different direction i want to do things a little different compared to the 15 plus years that i've done before where the performance department the kind of conditioning department call it what you may was heavily weighted towards kind of having a lot of strength and conditioning guys on staff and we would find ourselves always uh carrying the load of nutrition carrying the load of science now, of course, some bigger teams uh, would automatically have five strength and conditioning coaches, uh, two full-time nutritionists, uh, a whole bunch of data guys running around and mental skills coaches as well. But smaller clubs, smaller budgets, uh, we actually opted to go slightly differently in the sense. So I'm going to go left to right. So at left is Connor. Connor is our full-time uh, sports nutritionist. Uh, we really felt that if we could take nutrition off, I mean, I've, I've been in the industry for long enough. I'm certainly not a nutritionist, um, but I'm going to be able to put really the, the basics, the foundations to work, but that's not giving enough credit to this whole discipline of sports nutrition and how nutrition can aid performance, how nutrition can aid recovery, um, how nutrition can help with sleep. And it's just, it's so much deeper than what we actually all can appreciate. And so I was like, if I have to sacrifice a position, a strength and conditioning position to have a full-time uh, nutritionist on soft, I'll do it. I didn't have to make that sacrifice, but I did choose not to add more strength and conditioning coaches. I chose to add more specialization. So Connor, full-time um, sports nutritionist. Next to Connor is Georgia. Uh, Georgia is our data wizard. So uh, basically what that means is we've tried the whole AMS system platforms before um, we've walked through a few options uh, we love them we hate them it's kind of this <laughs> real love hate relationship um, they have a good place in the industry but maybe it's my patience maybe it's my 
kind of curiosity of always looking for a new dashboard or always kind of mm. trying to come into in the space of half an hour it used to take us two weeks to build a dashboard basically uh, with a couple of back and forths with the uh, AMS company so we were like if we want to look at data at a much deeper level and peel the layers of this onion away to really kind of get to the core of some of the questions that we're trying to answer we need someone literally her desk is literally just behind my desk we're kind of in a galley kind of a blind and she's, she's right, right behind me and i'll fire questions across to her and i'm expecting her to come like at the end of the day and say yeah i'm working on it within a half an hour she's like hey do you want to come across and see what we're doing so i'm like this is a, a winner position for us connor full-time nutritionist that takes a lot of responsibility off it actually just frees our mind it frees my mind it frees the mind of the strength and conditioning coach that's anton in the middle anton's from finland super interesting journey through Finland, through this uh, America to come and get uh, educated, then in Colombia, and then we, we yanked him out of Colombia and said, hey, come to LA. Um, so no relation because he's Finnish and because he's Finnish <laughs> that we hire him. <laughs> um, there's me, um, the old guy, the dad of the group, um, holding up a two, because this is our second supporter shield that we won. Uh, we won this in 2019 mm -hmm. as well. Right. Um, and then Vicky, Vicky is a new addition to us as well. So um, she's not full time at the moment, although she would love her to be full time. She is our mental performance coach. So if if you relook really at that performance department, we're actually like that ratio just doesn't seem right. Hey? But I think because Anton's mind, my mind, we're free from having to deal with a small little hey supplement this or, or do this or create this data set we're able to maximize our time in the club as purists like pure strength and conditioning coaches yeah that's that's really a unique model gavin um lean maybe eliminate some of the communication because it's so streamlined and i've been there in the back room of lafc it is just a row of desks back to back with each other so you can all communicate with each other there um that really yeah. that's, a, that's an interesting model and i um, I appreciate you sharing a little bit about it. When we start thinking about comparing players and, and thinking about the demands, um, we were talking about what does it look like from player to player within the team? And, and we, we put together this, uh, this graphic. And if you wouldn't mind walking us through uh, what you have yeah, here. Absolutely. Um, hopefully people don't get lost in kind of all the numbers and all the, the words and those kind of things. I mean, the question always comes, why is it important to monitor internal load? in in a sport in soccer and rugby and whatever sport that you would and i think the best example that that i could come up with and i mean what i always and not even having a slide i would always say is at the end of the day if you're only looking at external we could all have the athletes run five kilometers um with a couple of high speed efforts with a couple of change of directions and then we would say hey they did exactly the same training session yes they did they did exactly the same external training session but we don't know what that session actually cost them right so there's a cost uh, to putting that output um, it's the same as uh, my brother-in-law and i we we drove the families down to mexico for thanksgiving uh, he has a non-hybrid and i have a kind of semi-hybrid car and he had to stop for gas and I still had like half a tank of gas right. left, but we drove exactly the same distance. We started on full. He had to pull in and I'm like, I made the right choice of uh, getting the hybrid car. So um, here we go. So um, if we use that hybrid analogy, whole bunch of numbers. So player A, player B, um, one slightly older than the other, exactly the same uh, position. Uh, if you look at all the external metrics that maybe a team would be looking at, it looks like a pretty similar session, right? Um, just shy of five kilometers, kind of equal amount of high speed runs, almost the same number of sprints, axles, decels. So you're like, ah, oh, you pretty much drove the same distance, right? You drove down to Mexico and pretty much covered the same distance. But interestingly enough, it costs the younger athlete way more compared to the older athlete. Although the perceived exertion of the older athlete, the 23-year-old, imagine calling a 23-year-old old, but anyway. Um, yeah, so both of them gave an RPE of seven on the day. Now, RPEs are subjective, right? Uh, rating of perceived exertion. Um, 
that could be that athlete didn't sleep really well. Um, maybe his kids up at night a couple of times. And so, yeah, he's tired coming in training and that training session was tired. Although internally, when we measure what did that actually cost him, significantly less than the other. And so, yeah, that's why measuring internal load, although putting another thing on the athletes, having them wear one more thing, having to download more data, having to kind of collect more data is sometimes annoying, but without it, you're actually, you're, you're driving with one eye uh, closed and not advised. Kevin, um, there's so many questions we could gather just off of this one slide, but I'll, I'll prompt people to consider the training age of these athletes, right? So the 23-year-old versus yeah. the 20-year-old, how long they might have been training in a professional competitive environment and whether yeah. it's kind of the understanding of the game model of what's happening within the team without obviously naming yeah. the players. Um, could you give some insight into say that maybe player A maybe has had more experience in a professional competitive environment than player B? Um, so, yeah, I mean, we always, when we see something like this, we try and rational it, we try and justify it, we try and figure out like, okay, uh, it must be because of A, B, or C. Um, we can eliminate the majority of, uh, player B didn't come back from injury. Um, he's not new to professional sport. Uh, he's not a starting fullback. Um, uh, player A is a starting fullback, has got more years of experience, um, just runs more efficiently. At the end of the day, his capacity is better than players B. And, and so then it kind of breaks out and splinters out into way more, yeah. more questions. Yeah. It's like, how much of player B can we actually train? How much, of that, how much of that efficiency can we change? Can we take the car in and get it kind of changed into a hybrid model? But at the same time, uh, player B, what are we going to do from a recovery strategy? Because if this guy burns hot, right, that's literally just the phrase that we're using. And we'll see it on the daily report. We'll see his week to week. We're like, man, this guy, we, we, we got to ensure that there's good session to session recovery, especially during preseason when we're banging out some big uh, training yeah. sessions. Um, but yes, it, any, any data set's going to make, it should make you curious. And it should make you kind of ask those questions of, all right, this is understandable. The guy's coming back from injury uh, or he's coming mid-season and he took a two-month break uh, because he's come from one league to another league. So um, it should direct our decision-making and it should kind of um, continue to make us curious. Yeah, so when we think about uh, decision-making and being efficient, um, explain a little bit about maybe some of the travel demands and how that impacts what you're seeing regarding to the internal demands of the, of the players. Yeah, absolutely. So um, this is a slide that, um, yeah, a good friend of mine, Garrison Draper um, put together. Um, it really just tries to buy a little bit of sympathy from everyone around the world. <laughs> if I can say it simply in the sense of, uh, in the Netherlands, we used to jump on the bus and we used to drive and we used to get to the stadium within like an hour. And then if we had to go up north, we'd go like, hey, this is the day before trip. So we'd, we'd take two and a half hours with a bus and go up north, spend the night in the hotel. The majority of uh, traveling in the US is extensive. Like our only local is when we play the Galaxy, then it's like a bus trip down the road. But everything else is you jump on a flight, and that flight could be anything from two hours to six hours. It could be uh, time zone changes. So if we go East Coast, then we're going to obviously have three hour time zone differences. It could be into a uh, Texas region. Uh, where you wake up eight o'clock in the morning, you're like, hey, I'm going to go out for that walk and go find a good coffee spot. You walk out and it's already 32 <laughs> degrees at eight o'clock in the morning. And you're like, maybe I'm not going to go for a coffee. Maybe I'm going to go for an ice coffee right. or something. Yeah. Or we're, we're about to go to Colorado and that's going to be altitude. And so I'm not saying other leagues don't experience this, but maybe they don't experience it on such a regular occurrence. I mean, this is our week in, week out uh, traveling. So there's, there's a huge traveling demand on players, environmental stress is there as well. I think that this slide is just meant to make us realize that our athletes are exposed to maybe certain things that other athletes around the globe are not. And so we need to pay even more special attention to 
recovery strategies, the recovery of the athlete, um, the game demand in elevation, the game demand in uh, heat as well. Um, so yes, we, we do a lot of traveling and our athletes get used to that, obviously, but for the European guys that just come into market, it's interesting to watch them for the first year when they're like, oh my goodness, another flight to another game to another time zone difference. So yeah, it is. Yeah, and I think that's an important piece, what you just said, which is as players come into the league, which as this league continues to grow, um, and we see more and more players coming in from different parts of the world, their ability to adapt and adjust to the time zones, to the travel, you know, yeah. those are some real conversations that are happening on a daily basis with the backroom staff. And yeah. when you when you when you get players that come in, maybe maybe early in the season or mid season, um, we 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 can provide real time feedback on your training session. And so it, it, you might see somebody in the red zone early, but it may not be a red flag because they just came from somewhere across across the pond, and they're just getting kind of used yeah. to the adaptations. Um, when you look at this data live, which obviously the players on the screen here are not LAFC players. Yes. Uh, when you look at some of this data and you talk about the heart rate zones that they're in, how does this help you make in, in training decisions? Yeah, it's, uh, it's really important for us to not always do, do the things after the fact, right? Um, if there's no live monitoring and this is live external monitoring is live as well as live internal monitoring. Um, yes. So I'm, I'm mic'd up with uh, Georgia. She's on the side of the field. Um, I'm kind of on the field or just up to the side during the training breaks. I'm going up to the, the coaching staff and I'm not bad at when feedback is needed, feedback is given, right? You, you also don't want to just be this foghorn that's kind of constantly blurbing out things. It's like, hey, when something needs to be addressed, we need to address it. And um, when we set goals for the day uh, and we are trying to achieve a certain amount of conditioning load, um, this becomes invaluable, right? Uh, being able to have a look and see, all right, uh, knowing uh, an athlete's baseline from that previous slide, um, knowing that a big day for him would be 140 trim, for instance, or uh, athlete A, knowing him an 80 trim would be. so almost having that kind of cheat sheet on the side and knowing like, hey, where are we trying to get to with the plan that we have? This helps it. And then that means that we can extend an extra set. Um, we could potentially make the bouts longer because the shorter bouts, obviously heart rate climbs, but heart rate drops. Um, where if we maintain longer bouts, then obviously your trim score is going to be affected by that because guys are going to get their heart rates up and they're going to stay there for a while. And as we understand, I don't know if I need to get into kind of the definition of trim or how trim is calculated. Maybe you can uh, you can jump onto that, James, because we we obviously use that as a very important indicator for us. Um, but live monitoring of external and internal load, even to the point of sometimes I'm like uh, go to the coach and say like maybe this grid we need to open it up just slightly, and it's mm. incredible mm. how just the change. I think on one of the slides I've got an example how just the difference of another five meters making something longer all of us sudden shot the external load numbers probably overshot them and i was like oh, oh darn i don't think i can go back to the coaches now and say hey can we uh, trim the field by five uh, five meters but <laughs> the training session actually ended up being fantastic but micro changes yeah. like that can have good uh, good good effects yeah so trim is essentially intensity times duration so it's always accumulating throughout the session so as you alluded to if you extend you know, if you go an extra set or an extra rep of one higher, uh, but be because it's using the internal load metric to, to quantify intensity, the intensity may not be as high. Um, so it's one of those things that you can yep. look at trim per minute. Uh, do you guys utilize trim per minute at all in, in your analysis? Um, that's some, that's next stage for us. Mm -hmm. Like that's what we have spoken about now that we have the resources and the kind of uh, personnel to do. Yeah. We'd, we'd love to get to, to trim per minute, even in our drill database. Um, and then even in our live monitoring, uh, trim per minute is kind of, as they would say, it's, it's in the second quarter pipeline or whatever you tech guys are keep saying that the updates are coming, <laughs> but they're always, always in the next quarter. We always want to be. It's only coming in 
Well, yeah, and, and if you go back, go back to the staff and the setup of what you have, you're trying to be really lean, so pulling out you know key metric for you to keep going. There's a there's a question yeah. that I'll address now that came in through the Q and A just because it's it's timely, which is basically what you and I were talking about before the call, which is an athlete maybe saying uh, they're not tired, uh, but they can keep going. Uh, and how do you, those conversations are like, um, so the question basically is, is have you ever had athletes denying that they're exhausted based upon an internal load metric and wanting to push forward? Um, what is that conversation like? Yeah. I mean, that, that does happen frequently. Guys will come after training and they'll go like, Hey, um, <clears throat> excuse me. I'd like to knock out a couple of sets of uh, extra running. Can I do that? And then it's all right. Let's go and let's go and have a look and see what have you hit. What's your what are your external loads? Uh, how much range do we have? Because it's it, it's a range. You've got to be a little flexible. Because yeah, if the coach is unhappy with the way the training's going and he wants to add another two sets, yeah, that may push you to the upper threshold of your load uh, zones that you had. It may even throw it over it over it, and then you may need to make the adjustment next day. It's getting into dialogue with a player. If the player is coming off the field and he's frustrated and he feels like, hey, I just need to push myself a little bit extra, um, we will go to the data, we'll go and have a look. And um, I'm seldomly going to deny athletes, but I'm going to tailor it. I'm going to say like, hey, all right, you want to do this, but actually from the data, I can see that you probably benefit a little bit more from this. And you'd be like, okay, yeah, I'm happy to do it. He just wants to have the feeling of like he's done something because he came off the field, not feeling, uh, feeling pushed. So yes, we have a range. If we had to overshoot that range, then we would probably need to make some adjustments the next day, but dialogue with the player is valuable. Like I'd rather have that trust relationship or the athlete coming to you and going like, Hey, I, I really feel like I could do with a little bit extra and you go like, yeah, we've got a little, we've got some wiggle room in here that we could actually do something. Yeah, and then you get them in the gym and you have them do arms, so they feel like they've got a little extra pump. Uh, we know that it's there not going to hurt. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and so that was an interesting thinking about uh, the efficiency of a player you mentioned and building that trust with an athlete, and then um, you presented this data as maybe twofold: one that you could utilize within the team, but also if maybe yeah. an athlete is coming back from an injury. Um, and, and talk us through the process of, of what this data shows us here. Yeah, sorry, I had to change location because I was getting blinded from the uh, beautiful sun you have this morning. So, um, yes, yeah, so this here is trying to explain kind of a little bit of our thinking. Um, I asked uh, Georgia, the data analyst, um, look, if we can. I've used the phrase before, or I've heard the phrase before, like you fingerprint your athlete, okay? And I think that that phrase is specific around uh, fingerprints are unique. Um, I know that there are fingerprint warmups. Um, there are kind of repetitive drills that can be used, and then you can use internal uh, monitoring. You can use the new function with the first beat in terms of the recovery index. Um, where it's very standardized and you're trying to obviously then look at deviations and how much recovery there is. So I, I was like, okay, Georgia, let's have a look. Um, the top one is um, football movement profile. Um, there, there wasn't enough space in the slide. So obviously we have now for every athlete, we have uh, a data set of what their minus four, minus three, minus two, and minus one generally looks like, okay? Uh, in my experience, being in the league for a number of years, uh, coaches are repetitive. Everyone's got their habits. Everyone's got their favorite set of sure. Um And so the longer you are with the same coach, the more uh, your data set grows and the more the minus fours look like minus fours, right? Obviously, with a, a pretty irregular schedule that we have now with the CONCACAF Champions League and now this experiment with uh, Mexican League and the US League stopping and, and playing, some of the data is a little, little dirty, but I would at least say we're growing our data set in terms of minus fours, minus threes, minus twos, and minus ones with this coaching staff and with a pretty consistent uh, schedule. Okay. Uh, so if an athlete is injured and we are trying to recondition him what are we trying to recondition him towards full team participation of course but what are the demands of that athlete in full participation 
when do we think that we're going to reintroduce him? Are we going to reintroduce him on a day before a game? Generally, we don't like doing that because obviously the team's focus is now towards the game and the preparation. You don't want to bleed a new player into the, the team. So generally, our introductions are either happening around a minus four or a minus two. Those generally, at least for us, are lighter load training sessions externally and internally. Um, and introducing a player for the first time in a match day minus three, yeah, you've got to be pretty certain that he's able to tolerate that load. So in this slide, the rest of it is just really the, the internal load, uh, unique, unique fingerprint, if you were to call it, of uh, an athlete that we have, yep. um, just to show, and it probably would have been best to give kind of, these are average values because I could have given a range because okay. yes, sometimes a minus okay. three is a little light. So an improvement on the slide would have been like, okay, 124 is an average for Trimp on a minus three. He averages around nine minutes and 24 seconds in uh, 34 seconds in uh, the red zone. And his average RPE on that kind of day is an eight. Got so it. the message behind here is know your athlete, know what the demands are that your athlete experiences when he is fully fit. And therefore, you know what you're preparing him towards. And so if your reconditioning sessions have your player only hitting 60, 60 to 80 trump scores and you want to introduce him into a match day minus three good luck because um not only is reconditioning an athlete on his own completely different to when he's now having to go into a small side of game where he has to do a 10 v 10 possession things are firing at him and there's the cognitive element and there's a the physical element and there's the reactive element. You can't simulate all of that in reconditioning. So even if you do get a hundred trimp in reconditioning an athlete one-on-one, -on -one, it's not exactly as a hundred trimp uh, profile in a football environment, but at least it gets him close enough. Like I actually prefer even overshooting by about 15% in terms of these values um, when reconditioning guys one-on-one -on -one, uh, mm. level but all those external metrics as one you can get them fired and dialed down exactly like eight sprints 100 meters of sprint distance this much uh, x cells and d cells but you did that over a 70 minute conditioning session and he's meant to do that in a team environment in 55 right. minutes um, at a trip of this and the red zone minute of this. So individualizing your uh, return to play with athletes on external and internal loads is, is vital to kind of getting these guys back um, in, into the team environment. Oh, Gavin, that's so insightful right there. I mean, when you think about the averages for the team, but then there's the individual fingerprint, as you said, yeah. and having that about cheat sheet and knowing those numbers one of the questions that kind of comes up and it's it's in the chat and, and i'll maybe rephrase it which is you know you go through preseason, then you have a, with all these different competitions you're participating in at some point you may have to reevaluate your data to say okay uh okay first beat might give you an automated new max heart rate for an athlete but what is what is there now trimp values do you create new benchmarks uh quarterly uh, is it monthly? Uh, when you say go back and, and review the data with Georgia, how yeah. often are you going back to review it to the player's profile? Yeah. So um, I think before the webinar even started, I, I was commenting to you on one of the slides and saying, and we'll still get to that slide, is at least in preseason, I don't use, I don't use trim as a measure of uh, intensity um for internal load when i'm communicating to the coaches it's mostly down to rpes and my reasoning there is uh, we have a yeah there's a slide we have a very long off season and so we have some athletes that are diligent they do their i mean long off season in the range of like eight weeks guys are off for eight weeks so all the european guys are like that's yeah, insane that's right, ridiculous and i've been i've been there before like you're lucky if you get three weeks if you're an international and no. and now with obviously COVID and everything it was some sometimes even less than that but that creates a huge challenge for us to kind of keep our athletes conditioned because we also only have the same uh preseason duration so think of your 
uh, two weeks, three weeks, four weeks, and then you're kind of picking it up in preseason. We go two weeks, three weeks, four weeks. We're then off the screen, like keep going down, guys that are doing yeah, nothing. Yeah. And then you're trying to get them out of a, a very deep hole. Um, and so, yeah, I, I found that trim ridiculously high trim scores in the beginning. doesn't matter how kind of well-conditioned guys would come in. And even the guys that did stick to the plan, they hadn't had football training exposure. And so we actually just use RP in the beginning. So my fingerprint, how I've done it in the past is um, I try and look for three to four moments in the season where we have a, uh, a block that's pretty consistent. And so for me, consistent is can I find three times in the year where there is a four, almost a four week block of one game per week. Um, so that, that would basically mean that we have a minus four, minus three, minus two, minus one game, some kind of recovery. And then you have almost a three or four week pattern of that. And that for me is enough of a snapshot of where is the athlete at this point of the season Got for it. games. Um, so yeah, I look for three or four moments in the year. And then I use that as kind of benchmark, benchmarking moments just to re take that biometric assessment again like that fingerprint assessment again of like how does that trim score change throughout the season and do you do those do you do the fingerprints based upon um the days so match day minus four minus three or is it by exercise or is it a combination right now it's just on days okay because um when we get to the the kind of final slides in terms of the drill drill base or the drill database um we're still growing to the point where we're going to now per drill also have um, the load metrics or the internal load metrics per drill. But right now, even just having a good profile of what their minus three day looks like. And honestly, sometimes the drills are very repetitive, right? Um, small variations, but this drill fits best on a minus three. So therefore we should be able to kind of elude that on a minus three, we should be getting these values. Yeah, and that kind of talks a little bit about, you know, the, you said they're starting football. The guys want to play. The players want to play the games. Yeah. Um, and this was the, this was something that you presented as as another way to present some data to the to the staff. If you could talk us through this. Yeah, exactly. Um, so this is kind of in our certainly in our preseason, um, and we we do continue that now into our in season, but in our preseason. Um, because we're off for this kind of six, seven, eight week period, everyone comes back very hungry and very enthusiastic. Can you, so you can imagine what the first yeah, thing yeah. breaks everywhere. I'm like, no, we've got to do less of that. No, we've got to do less of that because everyone just wants to, we're like caged animals that just want to get out <laughs> and play football. So, uh, just from a loading structure, we kind of, we term different colors on different days. What, what are we trying to achieve externally? What are we trying to achieve internally on different days? Um, and so this slide again, which just has a ton of numbers, um, this is uh, Adam Owen and the kind of multi-metric uh, approach where we look at distance uh, zone five running, which we call, which is 5.5 to seven meters per second, then sprint distance above seven meters per second, and then some of X cells and B cells. So we basically, we take what is the team's uh, game average, um, and those are the values at the top. So at the moment, we're kind of averaging at 111 um, meters per minute, how many zone five meters per minute, zone six, and that obviously intensity, we bench that as 100%, right? The game we refer to as 100%. Now, obviously, there are some games that are 120% because we were just chasing the ball the whole day or sure. we had the ball and they were chasing us and we were doing lots of back and forth, but it's called the game 100. Then we we're able to break down the drills on the left-hand side down. So literally the drill ends and George is kind of crunching numbers out. I'm on my uh, AirPods um, in the middle of the field, kind of in communication with her going like, hey, uh, what was the drill intensity of that? Um, was it high? Was it low? Where are we sitting? I mm. know in the back of my mind, what did we want to achieve? And so uh, repeated sprint ability with finishing um, that second drill, you could see the intensity of that is obviously there's uh, high, higher than significantly higher than match values yeah. in terms of uh, high speed, some of XLT cells, and it kind of ends up being a 213% intensity drill. Here's the, here's the interesting one. So that first 11 v 11, it wasn't on a full size field, um, but 
yeah, that one over there, we ended on 109% uh, intensity. And that's the one where I said to the coaches, you know what, I think that we just need to open up the field a little oh, bit more okay. um, just to create a bit more space. And yeah, we didn't, we didn't open it up way bigger. And all of a sudden the values jumped to like 183, 218, 226. And I mean, they're short bouts. Yep. These are also created intentionally as overloads. This was an overload training session. This was a conditional training block. Uh, we wanted big values out of this day. We achieved them. We were quite happy. Um, the last one dropped off significantly, 151. I think there was a player that got kicked, went down. And obviously, when you're when you're measuring things per the minute, every time a guy's lying on the ground and he's taking up 20 sure. seconds, I'm like, just get up, just get up. <laughs> I, I wish like we were, I wish we were rugby at that stage and like leave the injured guy on his own, let the medic go and take yeah. care of him, and let the game just kind of continue continue with it. <laughs> so this this is just kind of a a, a snippet of. In, in training, we're, we're trying to make these micro adjustments. We're trying to set targets. We're trying to plan things ahead of time. We're trying to measure actually what's happening. And then at the end of the day, we're able to also send that to the coaches to kind of have them uh, evaluate as well. Like, were these drills too intense or, or not intense enough? Got it. Yeah. And my apologies. Yeah, I, I, to the... I clicked the slide there in advance, but it was kind of this idea of, of taking these drills and then creating these these profilers of, of what you're doing. And you said early on, you've gone through different coaches. Coaches are repetitive. Now you're working with, with yeah. Steve. This is a second Steve, year with yeah. him and developing kind of the consistent database. Um, and so there's this, this question is really twofold, which is why are you doing this? Uh, yeah. and, and how will that help you in future decisions specifically around perhaps maybe an Academy player? Yeah. Um, so I find this really valuable because um, we look at we look at each drill that Steve is uh, using and we measure that against a similar like what distance does that create per minute what high speed profile does it create per minute what XL cells does it create per minute as well um, and even to the point where I've, I've had some conversations where I'm like this drill is heavily weighted towards the center backs, mm -hmm. for instance. It's it's having them work, even though it's it's a 10 or 12 minute drill, it's having them work at well over 200% of game intensity for 10 minutes. Like, uh, is that what we actually want to achieve out of this? Or do we have to double up the number of center backs that we have and rotate them in and out so that if we double that up, that value could literally halve, right? And if everyone else is working at game game like intensities, is the drill aimed to overload those center back positions, or is it just a consequence of the drill and the nature of the drill? Like clearly, if you're creating a five v two attacking situation, those center backs are it, it's like the goalkeeper at the end of training that everyone wants to do some like extra right. shooting, and there's yeah. the, the young goalkeeper and he's just getting like fifty balls smashed at him, and uh, it's like significant overload for that one goalkeeper, but it it it's important to evaluate drills and to, and to have discussions because in that same drill um, where center backs are working like well above 100%, 150% of game loads, in that drill, we have midfielders working at as low as 40%. 40% yeah. so, so when I look at it, I'm like, all right, firstly, do the coaches know? It's, it's a fantastic drill. It's important. It's important to our game model, but maybe with the slightest manipulations of hey the midfielders need to also engage in the attack or the midfielder needs to track back and be kind of put pressure on the first pass that comes up in the transition on the other direction that literally and so we did do that and we tried it with one of the players and all of a sudden that midfielder's data jumped up from 40 percent up to like 88 percent wow so it's small tiny manipulations of uh drills and drill requirements and uh, behavioral players and drills can bring them closer to actually what are the physical parameters that we're trying to achieve we know what the tactical and technical parameters are but what are the physical parameters that we're actually trying to achieve and so there's no internal load measurements in this and i mean we're talking about internal load but this is the start of what we're trying to create in also then doing internal load into that yeah. as well, where we can go like, what are, the, what are the internal demands of this? At the moment, we're just evaluating external. And yes, in this drill, drill database, we can look at the entire team, but we can look at positional, but we can also look at like, what is the individual athlete actually experiencing at this moment? And to the point where we think 
picked up one or two injuries because our center backs are operating at 200% game intensity for 10 minutes straight where everyone else is like, hey, we're loving this because we're getting a lot of shots at goal and there's a lot of transition and there's a lot of good passing and like finding windows. Yeah, but those poor center backs are like chomping at the bit for uh, 10 minutes at 200% game intensity. Center backs don't like that. Center backs no. like one or two actions, balls, balls up the field. Yeah. They kind of look at each other and like, okay, let's get the line up. Let's go and stand at the halfway line. Hopefully our, our attackers are going to keep it down there and they take a break, right? They're, they're not, that's why maybe in small-sided games, they're also, they don't really like it because they're peppered with the ball the whole time and they have to like use their uh, their body way more than what they need to in a real game situation. So, Yeah, that's fascinating to think, you know, the connection between the sub principle within a game model, within the goal of the session, within the overall game model, if you tweak a sub principle yep. or maybe the size of the field, you can totally change the, the parameters of the physical response. And so you put together this kind of this drill library. Um, it's kind of known throughout yep. the staff as to certain metrics that you're going to hit. It could also potentially be shared with an academy director or if maybe there's a high potential player yes. with an academy, a 17 year old, a 19 year old that says, hey, you know, if you're on the same system, uh, you've got this data as a 19 year old or an 18 year old coming through. Um, maybe just share a little bit of insight about how that works at, at LAFC. Yeah. So again, a, a journey or we're in the process of building the out and expanding it even further and bringing this information down into the academy system into the second team because again it's a pipeline of you're trying to expose younger athletes to what they will be exposed to at a later stage as early as possible right so um creating a training drill cards that literally have an explanation of the drill the size of the field uh, a grid size like how wide how long was the field um, how many minutes were played and this is the physical profile of the actual I'd probably put it in team, I'd put it in center back, I'd put it in, so it's, it's literally like a laminated drill card and you can make a whole bunch of these. The, the tactical and technical principle is, is X, the physical principle is Y, here we go. If you're going to do this drill, you should do, be doing it on this day, this is what it's going to produce. And so finding that balance between not always small-sided, not always big-sided, uh, but finding that balance in the combination between the two, because yes, these athletes, need to be exposed to the next level up, the next age group up, and that age group needs to be exposed to the next age group up uh, physical demand so that it's not a new team per se that they're coming into, right. but it's a kind of philosophy of training um, that they're just continuing to get exposure to. Obviously, when they're coming from a, under 19 to a second or a second to a first team, yeah, the difference should actually just be the intensity because of the quality of the players that, that they're Yeah, to. no, that's great, Gavin. And I really appreciate that insight and that kind of where it leads into this idea that with First Beat, because we have millions and millions of data points, we've kind of created these global reference values. So if, if you're out there on the webinar or you're curious about maybe a starting point, you can go to First Beat's website and check out some global reference values when it comes to trim, trim per minute, as well as a movement load and movement intensity using the accelerometer within the device. So that's available free on the on the website. You can download and and maybe as a starting point, if you don't have any point uh, or you want to get interested in internal load to use these reference values and then contextualize them for your environment, I think is massive. Um, Gavin, you've been super gracious with your time. Uh, we're drawing near the end of the webinar. And, and for those that want to uh, access the webinar afterwards, we'll send it out via email. You can certainly contact me in my email. Uh, for further questions and check us out on the socials. There's just a couple of questions uh, in the Q&A and, and one in particular, um, which is when you talked about earlier about the substitutes or the non-playing players, um, you know, how do you manage that load? And I think you've talked about it a little bit when we got to the RTP slide, which was kind of yeah. like, hey, these are the team averages. We've got an individualized their fingerprint and their pathway. Um, do you do it on the same day of uh, a game. So if a player doesn't play in a game and you're at home, do yeah. you do the work the day of at home? And then if you're on the road, what do you do on the road? Yeah, great question. Um, uh, it's being as creative as possible. So looking for all the opportunities. So, um, I mean, we've got a pretty decent idea of the starting 11 um, the day before the game. 
game um either that's through video analysis or it's through like the lineup of the guys in the pennies and the guys not in the pennies or in the uh the vests so i will look for every little opportunity that i could find so sometimes the day before the game i'm already knocking out 25 to 50 percent of their high speed running requirements to get them to the end of the week um now, yes, there's some risk in that because you could you could make the argument of like, oh, what happens if someone goes down in the, in the second minute and that person needs to go in? Yeah, okay, then they may end up giving me 150% of what their normal game values are, but sometimes that even, have, that even happens um, in games. Um, and so it will be the day before, it will be the day of. Um, we had the uh, opportunity to give the guys two days off um, after the game last night. And, and there I am in the locker room walking around to a couple of the guys and going like, there's your heart rate bulb, off you go. Tomorrow right. I'm going to send you a run. And they're like, they hate me for it in the moment, but the having the athletes come at some point and going like, I'm just so glad that you're always on, on me and always on top of me, making sure that I'm like doing the work that's required because when I need to step up to come into the game, I'm, I'm really feeling like um, I'm at a high level than what I was. So... It, there is no script. There's no chocolate cake recipe here. That's like, look for your opportunities and grab them with two hands and just go like, hey, two days off, you only played 30 minutes last night. Hey, we're going to put in a big run tomorrow. You're going to take Monday off. We're going to have a full week lead into Colorado. And if you're starting, you're going to be at a fantastic level. It's there's We're more than just performance coaches. You're a psychologist, right? And it's you're also a communicator. Yeah. You're the ability to communicate the math to the, to the players. And I think... Yeah. I think players, we need to give them a lot of credit. They understand, okay, I've only played 10 minutes. I know I'm behind. I don't want to do the work. And then yeah. it's a little bit of a nudge. And to have, yeah. uh, you mentioned in your performance staff, you've got a mental skills coach. That's part of your staff that's integrated. I think that's that's a phenomenal coup yeah. for you. Um, and then a lot of times when it thinks about player stress, maybe we'll, we'll end it on this question, um, which is because of the travel demands and yeah. specifically a team that wins the supporter shields is going to participating in different competitions. There's going to be different stressors that come in that are going to elevate perhaps maybe their RPE um, or maybe yeah. they feel like they were a neutral player. So their RPE was a little bit less when it comes to their overall wellness and um, I guess, readiness to train. What are some other yeah. factors that you've seen in your environment that have contributed to perhaps a fluctuation or a change in RPE for your players? Look, we're dealing with uh, professional athletes that just like us have a whole bunch of stuff happening off the field um, that is having an impact on their readiness, their wellness, how well they sleep, how well they recover. I mean, we have young guys, no kids. We have older guys with four kids. Um, we have um, single dads um, that are carrying the, the burden of not even the, I mean, why I call it a burden, that they're just carrying the challenge of being a single parent and being a professional footballer at the same time. And so it's this monitoring and yes we do additional monitoring like additional uh, readiness monitoring with the guys and it's again just like a support service like hey we feel that you're a little low in this area over here here are some strategies of like things you can do in the immediate to try and have a, like a little rebound effect in terms of your readiness uh let's uh, emphasize a little bit more recovery i mean we can do a whole new webinar just on recovery yeah sure i'll, I'll give you the i'll give you the little 30 seconds this whole concept of coming for a 40 minute recovery session at the training facility the day after the game or second day after the game is we've advanced so much further with technologies all over the world and in all other disciplines how do we think that a 40 minute recovery session at the facility the day after or the second day after is actually recovery it's it's not we've, we've missed the boat we there's way more depth into what we should be doing from a recovery strategy and just saying hey coming to the club have a 40 minute little stretch little cycle and, and then we're done so we'll leave that yeah we could way. we could that's a whole nother webinar it's a it's a course it's a probably a six month course um well gavin you've been extremely generous with your time we're we're close to the hour mark and 
Um, for those that have, have got a question or you watch the webinar and you think of a question, feel free to reach out to myself or anybody at First Beat. You can find our information on the website. Gavin, thank you so much for your time. Uh, best of luck. And uh, we'll see you later this week in Colorado. Yeah, James, thank you so much. And uh, to Gavin, everyone that attended, thank you so much. Yeah, yeah, thank you. And thank you, everybody, for joining the call today. And uh, have a wonderful day, everybody. Take good care.